Um, I like what you guys were saying too about how the film was a lot about like 
how you're hearing about history and um, different histories of all the identities and stuff like that. And it made me think of the scene with the professor who was talking about the watermelon and Italy. And I was like, I never really thought about how possible it is to be such an unreliable narrator of someone else's history and especially trying to relate it back to your own identity of the Italian flag and a watermelon. Um, but I thought that was, it was cool because, I mean, storytelling and oral history is like a really big part of passing that lineage down of identities in different communities and stuff like that. And it was just, it was really kind of mind blowing to see someone else's perspective on something that I've had like such a deep, like definition of what it means to like call someone maybe a watermelon woman or something like that. So yeah, I, I think it was really like eye opening to see that maybe I shouldn't trust all my professors speaking about things that maybe they weren't there for and other stuff like that, or just speaking on other people's identities in general too and histories about. Yeah, also the part where um, that professor talked about how like the mammy figure was usually a full figured person. And she was like, well, that represents fertility in like comparison to a goddess. And it's like, that was not actually the intention of the people who like were casting and like presenting this mammy character caricature it was definitely like if you read any um in bell hooks and i a woman she talks about the way that like black women are very heavily like simultaneously like over sexualized and desexualized so like if you have that like heavier body type you tend to experience that like desexualization and as a result dehumanization because your only value would be a sexual value anyways you're not seen as a full human being like it's just and it just for her to misread that so completely it felt very dead on yeah I don't know um, I was just gonna say two things one that um I'm very pretty sure almost 100% sure in the like post credits it was talking of, or the, during the credits it said that the professor played herself so I'm pretty sure that was like an authentic interview with that professor I'm not entirely sure but I'm pretty sure that's what it said um and also I also think that was interesting like back to her comments on like the mammy trope and like how she said it was one of her favorites I just thought it was also interesting because in some ways I wondered if the film in some ways reproduced some of the archetypes that it sought to critique in the sense that the best friend Tamara was like the comic relief character the side character that was like the most stereotypically black that you would see as like in any other media as like a black woman and how she presented and she was heavier and she just like had certain traits where you could implant her exact character into white media and it would look like the type of character that a white person would create to be the side friend. Um, and also uh, with the whole narrative of the movie being a largely around interracial relationships and the fact that the desirable figure in the movie for the main character was a white woman and how a lot of femininity and what you see it depicted in was in that character and desirability through that character and through the lens of the main character. Um, and so it was like briefly touched on in the conversation about kind of the director and that phase relationships and stuff like that. But I think it could have gone into it more because I wonder if there was, because it makes you wonder how much of that was awareness or critique that was like fully questioning how the director herself had been impacted by these tropes and um, archetypes of media. Um, this is kind of a separate thing, but um, when you were kind of talking about how the um, film kind of like, analyzes like history and like the process of kind of finding things from history and like documentation and like who documents like history. I thought that it was really interesting the scene in the um, archives 
where they she went to the archives to kind of dig up like this piece of history that she had been searching for for so long and was having like such difficulty finding in you know more accessible places like the library and when she actually gets to the uh archives like they're just in these boxes but then when she takes them out of the boxes they're like no these are confidential and i think that it was like a really interesting kind of analysis of like how like people's histories are kind of treated like how they can be treated and where it's like okay but this is the only place that she can get like this particular piece of history but it's just like being arbitrarily blocked off and I think that that was like a really interesting kind of small point that was like touched on it Um, I was talking about this earlier with um, Miss Lauren Marshall because she like recently went to do like archive work in New York for one of um, her final projects. And I also have some experience in archival work through um, working at the Billy Ireland Cartoon Museum and having to modify my project so many times because at first I wanted to focus on things that related more to race, but they actually didn't have that in the archive. Um, and it was like really hard to find, which was um, really surprising to me given that um, the Billy Ireland has like the largest archive like in the United States of like comic book like material. Um, so it definitely does like speak volumes to like what gets archived and like, um, Reemphasize, reemphasizing like how in the film the person who was like showing the um, boxes was just like this is a volunteer led organization we hand like organize everything but one day somebody's gonna come in here and catalog everything and we're gonna have way more volunteers and we're gonna do all this stuff and I feel like that definitely does often get like pushed back to um smaller organizations or like grassroots like movements who are like putting in the additional hours of work and uh, trying to like really respect the information and like give it what it deserves but when it doesn't have like that funding or support coming from like external factors um, it does not it gets treated um like how it did in the film thrown out of the box and like onto the table and but then also like get kept from the same people who should like directly have like access to that work. Um, so I don't know, that was just like very uh, surprising to me, like the how the struggle was shown in the movie to like find all that work and how that still like very much continues today because a lot of the archive work that is still happening is done by people who do it as like passion projects and like dedicate their entire lives to it um and speaking to like people who like have worked as archivists in the past um they talked about like literally being nervous when like certain archivists die if it's like in a super niche um topic because that one person is like the person who like knows how specific like if they're like not done cataloging everything um if they leave that role or if something is like unfinished someone else can't just like go in and like complete like the rest of the archiving without like knowing like their thought process behind it. So like that um, is just like really interesting to think about as well. But if anyone has any comments like that or uh, relating to that or Amani's like earlier comments too. I have a small one, which is that I think that um, person who played the archivist was Sarah Shulman, who like actually runs the like real life equivalent of those archives. I could be wrong, but I think it's just a cool name. Yeah, I don't know if it's called. I don't know if it's called but, but yeah, maybe. I hope. I was hoping. I'm looking. <laughs> It is nice. <laughs> I do want to tie some stuff back to the book. I know it's not like it wasn't as like well read, but I am curious if people in the group like if they have any figures from their adolescence or teenage years where you find like 
disidentifying is like the accurate term for how you felt about a certain like cultural figure or if you, because I know the lesbian community stays disidentifying with like a lot of people, like a lot of like actors or whatnot that aren't necessarily actually like lesbians. So if like anything from pop culture pops out to you where you're like, oh, this community definitely has like disidentifies with this person, movie, figure, whatever it may be like this. Anybody have an answer? <laughs> no. I'm like trying to think of like characters from like movies and stuff as a kid that I watched where I was like, oh, I felt seen by this character, but they, hmm. I feel like it was a lot of, boy characters for me just because I identified with the girls they would go after. Um, I'm like, damn, she goes so far. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't have an answer. Well, oh, okay. I feel like lesbians to a certain extent disidentify with Raven. It's like, obviously she wasn't written as a queer character, but I think, I mean the world, but like literally her superpower was like world building, which is like, what so many of us like artistic neurodivergent, whatever you want to call it, people do. And like, she was goth too, which is another draw for the community. And she just wore a little bathing suit and a cape, like, I don't know. Can't. <laughs> One example from the book that was mentioned was the way that um, a lot of men in the gay community identi disidentified with opera diva, opera diva. So like before the civil rights movement for um, like gay people, like Stonewall and whatnot, um, opera divas were one of the like few figures of like opulence and like gossip and like hedonism that was available and like obviously like gay divas were not created or opera divas were not created for gay men but so much of like what they see in themselves and like what they want for themselves is like was found in like these figures so does that help anybody think of any um uh so like i um like a development disability and um, growing up it was a lot of um, watching people who did not have my disability play what they kind of thought that people with my disability would look like um but that's like kind of all that I had and so like I would often watch that and I feel like I mean I can tell that like you really like this isn't like really what like my experience is and I know that you're like person who doesn't have this experience like playing it which is kind of gross but like it's kind of all I have so like I'm just gonna watch it and like I do see some stuff did someone just basically like we have like a whole side camera you want me I can just bring it up to you yeah I got you sorry <laughs> How's that? <laughs> um, I was just gonna also say that um, it brought me back to the movie and how I was talking about um, that like race cultural archivist man that she visited said that all of the black people that went to these clubs only wanted to see like the white movies, even though they had the black movies there, they were like the pre-film, they're like the pre-early screening ones and they were not the reason why people went. And I found that interesting because um, I think that's still present in the black community. And I don't know, for me, it was like, 
also interesting that black women are like the highest demographic of like watching reality shows and stuff like that and I as somebody who used to be a part of Bachelor Nation um, and actively on Twitter and stuff, it's really interesting because I feel like this identification is a lot easier when there is no representation because as soon as there is representation, you can notice all of the ways in which you like see your lived experience being reflected in this media that you wanted to disconnect from in that way. So you look to characters and like, like thing, media that show the life that having somebody that represents you would be a reminder that that's not an accessible reality for you. So I feel like that's probably part of that cultural um, phenomenon as well. But um, Yeah, cool. Um, I didn't get around to the book, but I want to just make sure, like, this identifying is, like, identifying with a character that's not your, like, intersection of marginality, but you still, like, see yourself in them and try to, like, take the parts apart. Kind of? Kind of? Yeah, like, they, they are Okay. okay, I kind of have an answer. I've been rereading it, yes. Uh, uh, can you paraphrase it, but I think I got it. It's like kind of like seeing something like in the movie, like she sees like stereotypical like black women in the movies. And she, but she's kind of able to like break that apart and see the issues with the stereotypical depiction while also looking at the actual black woman playing these characters and identifying with that playing these characters while also kind of being like, so it's kind of looking at that, like breaking it into two and looking at both the person that you actually identify with and the Stereotypes and the level of cultural phenomena. Okay. In the book, of, go ahead. Being exceptional um, but like, or, like, see just how, like, talented and, like, good, I don't know. Okay, I'm gonna, I think I kind of have an answer, but I do music, and, uh, I produce, and I produce, like, kind of, like, rapish stuff, but one of my biggest inspirations is James Blake, who's this producer who's worked with, like, a bunch of big artists like Kendrick, uh, Beyonce, just everybody. But before I realized I was trans, he was like a huge inspiration because he was both emotional and male at the same time and like very successful. And now that I've realized like who I am, I still kind of identify with him, but I have to like, like my my brain fanfic is like, oh, he's probably actually a trans woman. But I'm like, oh, probably not. But I also like, I identify with like the parts of myself I can see. And I try to like take that and still like affirm it, even if it's not like my whole thing. But yeah. Um, I was just gonna add on to like the definitions that everyone um added to uh on the topic of disidentification. But um, as I, through this time, I've been able to pull out my handy dandy copy of the book. And <laughs> you, I'm not sure if it's mentioned like on the card, but one of the big things that like um, he talks about is like working through the lens of like dominant ideology. And it's like finding a balance. It's like neither 
um, assimilating uh, nor like opposing um, like the dominant ideologies that are like uh, presented um, or like that you're working with, but it's um, rather like a way of like working both on and against like um, these, um, whether it's like stereotypes or portrayals of like identity. Um, and I think like one of the things that he talks about throughout like the book and the introduction, which I'm most familiar with, is <laughs> the um, the way that it's this like theory is able to offer like um, like uh, almost like creative exploration of like identity um, in like the 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 world that we've been like handed and like the situations that we've been offered to like work with in the um, yeah, it went in the in understanding like the complex and like nuanced um, identities that like we all all hold. Right. Could you give like a short example of like uh, somebody just identifying? Um. Yeah, I think that um. I think that like in watermelon woman like the we talked about how um Faye Richards is like kind of like an example of like just identifying through like the um the because of like the time and like the um stereotyped like characters that she was like playing and I think Dee explained it really well um and it was like, like she did, yeah. I don't. Know. <laughs> she worked with what she had, <laughs> and she made excellent. Exactly. Yes. And that was like her way of like exploring what it is to be like a queer black, in like the thirties. Yeah, you're you're creating your new box with the box you've been given. Yeah, I feel like yeah, that for sure was a, a good example of like this identification, um, in a lot of ways. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was thinking back to the question I posed to everybody, and then I thought about like Judy Garland and the way like a lot of pop stars have been conduits for a, the queer community to like disidentify with. Um, Cause like most of these pop girlies are straight, but they do so much. We love our hags. Like they just, uh, yeah. I lost my thought, I'm sorry y'all. Um, so there's this one like Mexican pop singer who was like very, very popular, like for me, like growing up, who, like passed recently. And his name is uh, Juan Gabriel. And his nickname is El Divo de Juarez. So instead of being Diva, it's Divo, um, which was like a title given to him in a place such as Mexico, who for the most part um, doesn't tend to be as a Catholic. Um, Catholic country doesn't tend to like be very um, kind to people who like are queer, like share those identities. So his role as like a very famous like pop singer um, really like influenced like people's like perception of him because um, there was always that question in the air of whether or not he was gay, um, and he was very silent about that in turn like to protect his career and like what it would mean for him, like still existing like in the country and like touring and like his fame and all that. So he had like lots of like girlfriends and like kids and all this stuff, but he was still like a, a like Dom, like that nickname, like a Devo. And then like, as he was like getting like older in age and like feeling like coming like towards like the end of his career, he became way more like open. Um, uh, that's not true, not open, but he would like hint more to 
his true sexuality and he would stop like evading like the questions um because of course that would be like every single one but um he grew to be such like an important um figure um <laughs> hello douglas um, <laughs> um he grew to be such like a a figure that like people looked up to because he was so like idolized and his like music was very popular in reaching places outside of the U.S. But still, um, holding this identity and performing in the way that he did, um, very like similar to Elton John, I would say, like the Mexican version of Elton John, or maybe like um, maybe like Prince too, like very like um, in the way that like Prince was very stylized and people were like always asking Prince whether or not um he was gay and uh, yeah I hadn't thought about Prince in that in that um way before too but he definitely is someone that many people um is identified with just watched Purple Rain recently <laughs> I have two thoughts another one is so like Judy Garland definitely represent was like somebody for white queers to disidentify with but I watched the Donna Summer documentary on HBO and she was someone that a lot of like black and queers of color I disidentified with until she made those allegedly made those um like anti-gay comments but she loves the gay community she does she said so um and then to go back to the book I remember um the author talking about this lesbian performance artist who's Cuban and she saw on TV and that's what like in a lot of ways clicked things for her these like three lesbians on this um reality TV show like chain smoking and like getting ass grilled by this um TV host and there were parts I think in the the book where he talks about how basically her performance art does reflect like in some ways a desire to go back to the time before there was like more queer assimilation and also in the movie it was Cheryl was reflecting on a different time in like queer um history as well and where she was like oh I would I bet those clubs were fun and stuff like that um I'm curious if anybody had a phase where they were like well oh, I just wish I could like go back into that time before like things were this way or whatever or if like what do we think like the history of like who we are so like for queers it would maybe be like the like 80s 70s like I don't know what I'm trying to ask. Basically, like, are there pieces of art or are there things where it's like you visit it and you're like, this feels like what the community, like, feels like the community that I'm a part of is no longer like holding this standard or whatnot. Like, and it's almost makes you wistful for like another, that other time. Does that make sense to, to anybody? Okay, I'm not. Um, I'm actually okay. I have a few things, and then I'm gonna touch on that. Um, okay. The one other thought I had was the Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo, um, as like an example, because <laughs> um, yeah. And then also, dare I say, Glee, <laughs> like. Dare I say it, because I feel like that's real for some of us. Um, anyways, uh yesterday, um we Stephanie, Grace, um, Allison and I went to the No Name Book Club meetup in Columbus. Um at it was like right across the street from Upper Cup and um was hosted in the space um, where Black Men Build, the organization is like based. And um, they read the Communist Manifesto and then the coldest winter ever. And it was a super like interesting conversation. And we talked mostly about like the 
communist manifesto and like um everybody there had like very experiences and like um, knowledge of communism and like it, yeah it was super cool um and the moderator made like a really interesting comment about like romanticizing um like times before um and specifically in regards to like colonization and um he said something really interesting about like we shouldn't um be like doing that necessarily because like there um we shouldn't be like um rewriting wanting to like rewrite histories and like like I wrote it down in my other journal but if you guys know what I'm saying and could explain it better I will gladly hand the mic over but I think that's relevant here and it, I just I think that um there is something there is certainly like difficulty and harm that can come from like romanticizing earlier times and like uh, yeah and are you gonna say something I I think that's a good point to make Morgan I also think that like something particularly like I guess in queer history is this idea that like as time goes on the world will just inevitably get better for like the queer community and that's like such a lie and like I feel like we see that now and I feel like Grace and I did a project <laughs> called like the LGBT history of St. Louis so like we worked on some archival stuff this is in like 2020 so um about like um queer nightlife in St. Louis and it was just interesting to like some there's a part of queer history where like moving it I guess like moving in the underbelly was like actually like somewhat more liberating than maybe moving in the overbelly or the regular belly. Um, but it's just, it is like interesting to think like, I think we also at the same time, not romanticize the past, but also accept that now is also not good. <laughs> Sorry, that's like not a great point, but like that we have to keep organizing to like, like things don't come naturally. Like you have to work hard and organize for it to like happen. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know if that was like related at all, but I'm just thinking. It was things. good though. I feel like also, I don't know if it's a stretch, but like also kind of in the terms of like disidentification, I feel like there's a desire to either like, I don't know, or it feels like you wanna like either like, I don't know, like accept or like assimilate, assimilate into a dominant culture or like shake it off completely and like like go back to before or something like that and like I think like what like I don't know these sorts of ways of thinking about it lead us to is that like yeah all we have is like what we have and like like making what you can out of that and like moving forward through it Yeah, I think that's why, like, the theory of disidentification is, like, I've never uh, interacted with the term in, like, another context, but I think that from what I understand of it, it is really, like, such a, like, such a um, rich way to, like, uh, explore identity because it really is like it it requires that like intention um to like have like an understanding but which like isn't like it's really like taxing like emotionally and like puts a lot you have to like go through a lot of work to like do it but you have to have like both an understanding of like the world as it is now um to be able to like imagine like create like these imagined like um like ideal futures um when it comes to uh identity yeah so that's why i think that it really and in regards to like performance like there are so many like beautiful <laughs> things artistically <laughs> so um 
So we are nearing the end of our time together. So does anybody have any final remarks or like lasting thoughts, questions that you would like to offer to the group before um, we give like our last notes? Okay, I'm gonna pass things over to Ellen. Uh, thank you guys so much for coming, and it's always so awesome to see everyone here. I look forward to it all the time. Um, a reminder, we are doing the Queer Hobbies of Color showcase, performance showcase, and we are going to be accepting submissions for that until Wednesday. Uh, so if you guys know anyone or would like to submit something yourselves, we would love to showcase any type of like creative work or anything like that. Um, next book of the month. Ooh, next book of the month. Yeah. Um, we are doing Solaris by Stanislaw Lem. Um, personally, I'm really excited for this. Um, it's short, it's not, it's not too long, and it's really interesting. Um, be sure to pick up your copy from Bookspace Columbus. Um, he ordered copies for us. Um, yeah, okay. I'm gonna pass it back to Morgan to end us in some secure bags that we need. It's me again. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> Sorry to bring up yesterday again. Sorry, not sorry, but it was just so fun. And if you're, we'll definitely be posting like uh, when No Name Book Club is like going to be meeting again. But um, it was a really like awesome group and such a great experience. And the um, moderator, whose name is escaping me right now, is the um, the oh. So at the end of the meeting, um, the moderator ended with talking a little bit about the organization Black Men Build, which is a really cool like national organization who like they have um a uh branch based in Columbus and they do a lot of like really really great work with um in a lot of like different areas um but he ended the meeting with like uh talking about their guiding the organization's guiding light which is their grounding values and um, so inspired by them, we're gonna start ending our meetings with like speaking on a little bit about our values and like the reason why, like what um, what this type of um, group work is like grounded in. Um, and so let me actually get it really quick. Um, okay. Yeah, so um, as, so this, we actually um, developed these um, values in an effort to improve our about tab, which uh, sprung, <laughs> they're really beautiful and awesome uh, team build, uh, building and like bonding and like, uh, growth experience of which we're still in the process of but we do have like um so first um one of our first value is community and creative collaboration um and we recognize that like collective interdependence is fundamental to the livelihood and liberation of our kin in a social and political environment where individualism has large largely has largely impacted <laughs> has largely advanced as the status quo um and uh this is like really comes from like a place of um striving to inspire like radical change and like community conversation um next is uh creating like a radically alternative space um so we can all um think back to experiences in which um uh educational experiences have really um brought us down or like tainted our um 
relationship to learning or even reading. Um, and so it is our like hope that as a group, we can come back to that and create a space where like learning is safe and like friendly and like hopeful and um, just prioritizes like care and compassion at the forefront. Um, and it challenges those like hierarchical practices of like educational institutions. Um, and through like promoting um, curiosity and like holistic understanding. Um, and then next is friendship as care work. And our hope is that uh, first and foremost, we're all friends here. And we think that like friendship is a really beautiful way to like conceptualize um, our understandings of care and care work and um, and that it's like nurturing and compassionate and it's uh it require it's the the it inspires us to claim responsibility for the essential labor that is like patient time and like intentional effort and learning um to like create these like loving friendships um and empowering and like growing with one another. Um, and lastly is intention and integrity. Um, and we we hope to like ident like ideally define our group as like practitioners um, whose habits embody the work with which we interact. Um, so this is and this can be like everything that we do is like purposeful and deliberate, and we hope to like um, where we recognize that like honesty and transparency and sincerity is like grounded in like our strong moral virtue um, and we always uh, hope to like dismantle um, accountability as like a shameful tool and redefine it as like a positive mechanism um, through which personal growth is encouraged and goodwill is always assumed as the norm. Um, so I hope that um, yeah, that's those are our four guiding lights, um, and that's what we we hope Hardcover Hotties Book Club to be, and which we'll continue to do throughout our time. So, um, yeah. So, we'll break. <laughs> Um, thank you all for coming, and we'll see you next month. Bye, everyone.